Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, season special, like what we do after every season. So I guess maybe not that special. <laughs> it is a special. This is the fifth time we've done this. This is our season review and recap this time is for season five the final season of miami vice just in case you haven't heard us talk about that already (laughs) this happens to be the final season of miami vice (laughs) this is a non-typical episode for us we're going to go through we're going to review season five we're going to talk about some things we liked Lots of things we didn't like and uh, do our normal rundown, which is our favorite guest stars, our favorite episodes, John and his season five recap on music, and then give our final thoughts on this season. It's a really fun episode for us to do to look back because doing an episode a week means that it takes like four to five months for us to do an entire season. So doing these kinds of things is fun to look back and see what did happen during this season, reminders of all the things that did happen. And all the things that we wished happened (laughs) by the time we got to the end. (laughs) So no special lead this week or anything. We're just going to jump right into it and really sum up this season, do a recap on all of it. And then, of course, we can't end this episode without our season clip show, which is easily my favorite thing that we do every season as we do this clip show and play clips of all of our best moments, not the show's best moments, our best moments that we had during the season. And we got a lot of winners in there, including someone owning a pasta factory. (laughs) 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 So without much further ado, let's just dive right into it and let's do a recap on this season, season five of Miami Vice. All right, guys, like I mentioned, this is a long season based on how we watch it and we did some recaps in between too so it's been five months or so so looking back through on season five there are some things that we do need to talk about how season five went and in the end what we hoped and what we did see that happened so it's gonna be kind of loose just kind of going back and forth and talking about some things that we saw i am going to kick off this week and jump all the way back to episode three of this season of Go With The Heat, which is right after Redemption in Blood, we did a amnesia roundup. We went back through, talked about the whole amnesia story arc, the Sonny Burnett story arc, and gave our thoughts on how that went. Now that we've gone all of this time after it and seen how the show tied back to it, because at the time we almost unanimously said, that the show should have ended there, if anything, only one more episode. So now that we we went 20 or 19 episodes since then, how do we feel the rest of season five went after Amnesia? I think now that I've seen the entire season, I still think of the season as almost three mini season. We mm. started with mini season of the Amnesia arc. Then we had the way it ran on NBC as the middle season. And then we've got the lost episodes as another little mini season. I think you could still make the argument they could have ended after the Amnesia arc. You could also make the same argument that it could have gone beyond free fall, especially if they included the lost episodes. I really feel that Amnesia arc kind of bleeding into season five, like almost could have just stayed in season four. Mm. And then I think that might have worked the best. Like, yeah, that's just true. And have that carryover. For me, I think that, that maybe that's how it should have happened. And maybe we wouldn't have gotten so distracted going further into season five. Because I don't really feel like the amnesia arc, even though it does tie in later in the season, I don't get tied. It, it's as big of a deal, especially as we get toward free fall. I think at that point it is when the show realized that this was going to be the end run. And then you kind of start to feel like that's when we start bringing up Hackman and stuff like that. And some of the older storylines start to tie back in. They bring Pam Greer back in one of the lost episodes. We, we get closure with Lombard. So I just, I kind of feel like maybe instead of ending the show after the Amnesia arc, that the Amnesia arc probably should have just stayed in season four and then season five been everything else. I agree with John. I think they should have made... I first of all, I should say this. I don't think they should have. I don't think they should have ended with the amnesia arc. I don't think that would have been. That I think that too. It would have been left too much stuff open. I know they didn't close everything out. I know, but but I agree with John that they should have probably made it be the end of season four because there was no correlation between what happened in the amnesia arc and anything that happens in season five. There's nothing. There's no like we're not even gonna get like we don't even get like a mention of it. <laughs> 
at the end. By the end of it, you're like, oh, that happened at this season? Forgot all about that. Like, you don't even remember that he was married to Caitlin. You don't remember any of that. So I agree that they should have. It would have been better. It made more sense story-wise if they just closed that out in season four, had all that be season four, and then be season five is just like them being the done and, you know, you're starting over again. That is crazy. I, something I didn't think about is it really does, and John, you're right, too, it's like, like a mini season. Like, Amnesia feels like it's so long ago. It makes you feel like, did that happen this season? Was was all that stuff mm-hmm. happen? And then by the time it gets to the end of the season, when you think IAD is going to be all over Sunny for the rest of the season, it really only comes up a couple more times. Then the same thing with Caitlyn. Not only, is, obviously, Caitlyn has died in the, in the previous season, but she almost never comes up. And if it wasn't for the Lost episodes, she may never come up throughout the entire rest mm-hmm. of the season. Yeah, she's not, she's not brought up at all. It, it doesn't have any like correlation to the story. And also, like they have changed so much from the beginning of the season to the end of the season. If you think about like the, the, the team as a whole, so half the season, Don Johnson was gone, so Sonny's not in them. And that's how they tried to make it like, oh, that's because of the that's because of the amnesia stuff. He's not in there. But it like the rest of the team is like all in it in the beginning, right? They're like trying to help him and they're trying to do all these things for him. And they're non-existent at the end. And along those lines, we did get a lot of closure in this season. Valerie, Lombard, Mei Ying, we got a Castillo ending storyline that happened earlier in the season. So was that enough, John? That those story arcs got closed out, or was there some other stuff that you were hoping was going to happen by the end of the season? Well, I mean, of course, there's always stuff that was left unresolved. We never found out if the pirates ever catch up to Stunny <laughs> from uh, Frank Zappa's episode. <laughs> find out what happens to Baby Tubbs, even though Lando comes back masquerading as Angelo Alvarez. <laughs> there's quite a few storylines that they left open where it's like we never got that closure for me th- there's really two people that stand out to me that i'm really surprised at how the season went one is castillo we see throughout the season in the early parts he's burned out in a heart of the night his ex-wife comes back and you see mm-hmm. everything that he goes through with that. And then in Miami squeeze where he's almost killed. Yeah. And essentially at the end of Miami squeeze, when he's almost killed, we get that heartbreaking scene where Sonny is there with Castillo and he's saying, we're a team and we're going to be there together forever. Where was that talk at the end of free fall? Sonny, when you're just tossing your badge in the ground <laughs> in the parking lot. <laughs> well, I mean, Castillo wasn't exactly what? like helping them throughout that episode. He was like, eh, <laughs> but the, the last the point that I was making there was that after that, he, it basically does kill him because Castillo bas- doesn't come back no. after that episode. No, he doesn't. Yeah, the yeah. lack of Castillo is not is a huge po- bone of contention. Like, where is he? I understand. Like, they, I understand they were they were making other movies and doing other things, but they needed a better way to deal with it because it's completely. It doesn't make any sense in the stories, and it's, it's, he is missed. Like, his presence is missed through the whole thing. The same could be said about, about the other core members of the show. We never get any resolution on Stan's gambling. When we leave Stan, he's suspended, assuming that he's going to lose his job for going all rogue like he does. And then we really don't get any closure with the girls, as I think that in Free Fall, they get maybe two sentences out so like we really don't know anything about where where they're heading trudy did get kind of her own episode in asian cut yeah but she had she to be like tortured and yeah, stuff <laughs> caught up. <laughs> trudy only gets her own episodes if she's kind of being uh tortured or or <laughs> Load up, yeah, the one where she's she's got the bombs strapped to her. And they like completely forget about her. <laughs> but Gina doesn't get a standalone. She doesn't get some special story that's just for her. She does appear as a as you think is going to be a essential character in the story. Um, drawing a blank on the episode, the pasta story, the pasta episode. She's sorry, Broska. Yeah, yeah, she is in the middle of all that. Uh, so I guess yeah, she does get her own with yeah. Broska. Then Trudy has Asian cut. But they're both at the very beginning of the season. And the same thing like Castillo. They just disappear. Yeah, but I really want to mm-hmm. know what happened with the girls behind the scenes. Because it's something weird there. They literally just didn't write for them. Not like, oh, we don't, you know. Mm-hmm. oh, they want, And they didn't let them go do other things. I've read so many interviews where both of those actresses yeah. said, like, we would love to do other things. But it was our contract. We couldn't do them. So, yeah, we were kind of happy when Miami Vice ended. So we were able, like, 
you know, happy, but they were relieved and they could go on and do other things. But what were they doing? They weren't. So something was going on that they just weren't writing for them. I know we picked out some of the real challenges that they were presented with in season five because there was it was announced ahead of time that this was going to be the last season. And so they did have to deliver on it. But NBC had asked for a short run season and then they wrote these things and then told them, no, you're going to get a short season anyway. <laughs> they did nail some things. And we will talk about that in our favorite episodes from the season. It's real hot and cold, which is what we said at the end of season four. The good ones were really great and the bad ones were really bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But speaking of that good stuff, there was some really good things that happened. And we have our top three episodes. But let's first start with guest stars. Because guest stars is a very, very important aspect to Miami Vice. And we want to talk about our favorite guest star moments or our guest stars from season five. And John, I'm going to go to you first. How about you kick us off this time with your favorite or one of your favorite guest star moments that happened in season five? Guys, I kind of came up with three names that I, I felt really kind of defined season five from guest stars. At least from my point of view, breaking down the guest stars every episode. So I want to start with CCH Pounder, who played Yvonne in the episode Too Much Too Late. Not only was she fantastic in that episode, probably the best actress in the episode, but CCH Pounder is the Meryl Streep of TV. You know, she is in everything and Melissa and I both chose CCH yes, founder as like the <laughs> best guest star that happened in season five and it's so hilarious because it's in a lost episode yeah so she didn't even get <laughs> the yeah. recognition from that show <laughs> so and I feel like she kind of exemplifies the every season where we get that big name guest star who just goes on to be just a powerhouse for the rest of their career she was kind of a season five's her guest star in that mm -hmm. you know Julia Roberts in that area. My number twos, I guess, as far as guest stars, going to be split between John Leguizamo and Mark McCauley. And that's because these two guys are kind of the example of the Vice return actors as different characters. Mark McCauley with his five different characters in five <laughs> different episodes. I didn't have enough time to go through all of my notes, but I went through most of them, and I think he has the most different character appearances. So I wanted to give him a nod in this last season for showing up in, I think, at least one, if not two episodes in the final season. And then John Leguizamo, because he, he originally showed up in season one as Orlando Calderon, and then he comes back in Victim of Circumstance in this season as Angelo Alvarez. And so I think as far as all of the people who have played a character and come back and played a different character, I think he did the best as far as an acting wise. He's the best actor to do different characters in different episodes. It's so hilarious that they have so many repeat actors. And that's what I put down instead of choosing other actors that would be as my other favorite guest stars that are from the season. I put down everyone who made a repeat <laughs> appearance in season five because it was like they lived on the studio lot. And then when they wanted to make yes. Law and Order, it basically, they said, well, let's just go get them from the back 40. They're just out there like free range actors out in the back. That's how they were able to get the cast so full so fast. They had all these people just stuck <laughs> on the lot. They weren't even allowed to leave. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I think that as far as season five goes, I think John Leguizamo and Mark McCauley kind of, kind of uh, are my examples of that. For season five. And finally, my final guest star was Michael Chiklis from, uh, I believe, The Last Madonna. Oh, I forgot and he was in that episode. I remember now. Ponytail. Yep. <laughs> and, and, yes. And, and I wanted to throw him up there because I feel like in every season of Vice, in the guest stars, there's always at least one big name who really kind of got their break in Vice. Like, that was when they their career started. And I think as far as season five goes, we got a fewer of those than in past seasons. But Michael Chiklis was definitely one of those. He really hadn't been in anything really big when he did Vice. And Vice was one of the things that really opened doors for him. But I mean, all of it, when you go back to Michael Chiklis, when he did the episode in Vice, he was really an unknown. One of the things that we've brought up on guest stars a lot is that there's Vice was their first big thing. And Vice can be sneaky like that, where random 
actors show up and you completely forget that it's them that's in there and then realize later, like, oh, that's right, they were in that episode and they ended up being like in name 15 other shows. You know, like season four with Chris Rock being in Missing Hours. Like yeah. that kind of stuff. Penn Jillette being in an episode in season three. Like that kind yeah, of stuff. That's true. Exactly. I feel like that's that's kind of my list, or at least how I broke it down for guest stars, is like I felt like I needed to look at what were, what are the things that I focus on in guest stars every week. And it feels like those are the three things. Melissa, there was one in particular that you wanted to make sure it get called out as a great guest star in season five and although he's a repeat actor he's still one of our favorites of course it's izzy martin ferrero because he, they treat him like he's a guest star in this season and he's not in every episode <laughs> like he should be <laughs> he deserves to be recognized Very for true. his hard work that he put in all the time he was the best actor Very in the world no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Where well, would we be without Izzy? Jurassic- <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Where would we be without Izzy? We would not know about the crystals that he's selling or investment baking <laughs> <laughs> or the plants he was selling for a while or what else? What else was he doing? The nude portraits he used to take of people? Yep. Yeah, that was a good one for a while. Yeah, <laughs> I do want to give an honor- honorable mention to Pam Greer. She would have made my top three, but only played Valerie Gordon in both seasons. And two, her episode didn't air on NBC or USA, I believe. <laughs> so, I like how you're punishing her for playing the same person. <laughs> I well, mean, I mean, I mean no. when you want, if you want to come back as the same person, that's okay. I John guess. Lennon's almost came back as three different people. <laughs> exactly. I mean. <laughs> I mean, as I mentioned, guest stars are always crazy important part of the Go with the Heat podcast, and that's why we like to call them out at the end of the season. I mean, it's unanimous that CCH Pounder was easily our favorite guest star that happened, and it's again in one of those episodes that didn't exactly actually air. But it's sneaky. There's always so many people that make appearances in Miami Vice, and that's why Miami Vice is so iconic, is that you can say, oh, mm-hmm. hey, where did this person get their start? Uh, season five, episode blah, 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 Miami Vice, Michael Chiklis made an appearance. Hardly any show that is like that. No, I mean, what other show can you name that has had Bruce Willis, that has had Michael Chiklis, that has had uh, Jimmy Smith? Like, mm-hmm. All these people have been on there and like yeah. all in the beginning of their Wesley careers. Wesley Snipes. Yeah, Chris Wesley Rock. Snipes. Yeah. Of being Reigns. I mean, there's been so many people that are on there. Ben Stiller. Julia Roberts, even though her was a little racist. <laughs> All right, well, let's quit beating around the bush here and let's get down to brass tacks. Let's talk about our top three episodes that happened from this season. Yeah, there's some misses. Yeah, there's this. We talked about guest stars. Guest stars are always fantastic. We're always excited to talk about guest stars because of, like I said, like who knows who is going to make an appearance in an episode? Who is going to have the best ponytail in the history of (laughs) Miami Vice? (laughs) Uh, Don Johnson. But let's talk about our favorite episodes from this season, because when it was good, there were episodes that were so amazing. They are easily in like the greatest episodes of TV. Melissa, let's start with you. Let's okay. start with your, we'll go three, two, one. We're going to go around the horn. Melissa, let's start with you. What is your number three episode of season five of Miami Ice? Heart of the Night. Mm. The Castillo episode. Well, of course, because you know I love Castillo. So. <laughs> yeah, the Castillo episode for sure, because you get, cl- you don't get, it's not the closure I want, because it doesn't make any freaking sense. <laughs> the hell, why did she just walk away? She has, her husband's dead, right? Like, she don't have to go away. Her kid's dead. She has nothing else. Why is she, where is she going? He's so happy when they have sex. <laughs> <laughs> he goes into that room and sees teas ready. Yeah, he's like, oh. And, like, last night was so amazing. She's wearing his kimono and he's like, oh my God. <laughs> he's not, he's, he's like doomed to never be happy. And it's, it's very frustrating. But like I said, I do love the episode because you get to see him be, use his ninja skills for good instead of evil. <laughs> 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 And you you learn that he's very he's very strange when he comes to his house and sneaks around <laughs> when he goes home to his own house he sneaks around for a while before because you never know who's going to be hiding there. So yes, that is my number three. John, what about you? What is your number three episode of season five? My number three is Asian Cut. Only is it a truly delicious episode? <laughs> we get a theater of creepy dolls. We get the return of Hackman's wife or Lombard's wife. Or, I don't know. Someone's Sandy Dyson. 
<laughs> we also get Spider Martin playing Otis, which is his only acting credit. <laughs> I forgot about Spider. Yeah, Spider. <laughs> One of my favorite moments in Asian Cut, and I'm sure it'll be in the clip show, is when we get to the end and John's like, I swear to God, if this, if this <laughs> is room dummies. is full of mannequins, <laughs> we're going to have this is dolls. Yes. If this room is full of a bunch of dolls, we're going to have problems. <laughs> They, they did the creepy doll episode. It's forever a staple in every damn cop show. But I was very happy to get a a very truty full episode. So um, I feel so I bad take, for Trudy I gotta take too. her when I get her. I feel so bad for her because she's got to whip that guy. Oh, God, that was a gross episode. <laughs> well, my number three favorite episode from season five is, and it's one of the things that I love about Miami Vice and why even after we're done doing this podcast, I'm going to go back to Miami Vice and continue to watch it is that the show doesn't take itself so seriously. It's willing to have some fun, but then also have serious moments. So my number three episode is Miracle Man because it did exactly that. It was fun. They, it was loose. They were willing to make some jokes, take some chances, and then bam, right in the heart. Right in the emotional the gut. <laughs> yeah. Right I thought it was going to be all yep. chocolate guns and fun. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's our only Izzy episode that we get. So it's kind of our Izzy send off, even though it's not really a send off, but it is kind of our send off for Izzy. Well, and s- no, no, we get we get some Izzy in free fall, too. True, true. But I think he means like where it's all about Izzy. It's the only yeah, episode he's where he's like all the through it. Oh, it's like the whole gotcha. story about, about him. Yeah, yeah. Because he's in my several bad, of the episodes here and there. That. They're, they're willing to have some fun. Willing to make some jokes, but then also acknowledge something that is bugging people in, in modern culture in the 80s, which isn't just drug cartels out of South America. There's these other things that society is paying attention to. And in this case, it's street drugs and mental health. Yeah, it's so, the actual mm-hmm. drug, what the, what the street drugs do, but that come from South America. <laughs> what they do to people in the real neighborhood. Yeah. I'll admit, when I watched the episode, you know, I was having a lot of fun at first with the episode, but that by the end of it, like, it, it really hits you. And I really did think it was one of the better episodes. Melissa, let's go back to you. What is your number two favorite episode from season five? Hard Knocks. Because mm. I love me some Stan. <laughs> no, I love I love Stan, and it that one was very reminiscent of when Stan and Zito were together to me. Because it's like you get to, you get you get a whole episode of just something that's going on with Stan. Like, oh my god, he has a life beyond being in the bug <laughs> band, and just you know, and all he's the, so mean to his girlfriend. God, I know poor Holly. What does she stay with him for? <laughs> Anyways, no, but I love that. I like that episode. I mean, I don't like that it's like he's on the edge of being a different person and he I mean he that he commits murder. I don't like that part, <laughs> but <laughs> I do like that you get to see it's like a window into what Stan's life is like after he leaves the precinct, after he leaves the office and what he's what he's doing at home, how he's living and how it's really highlighted in that episode that nobody else cares about Stan. Really, the duo mm-hmm. don't care. They know. They're like, okay, well, you know. Then you find out later on that even Dad knew. And he was like, well, I just thought you'd figure it out for yourself. I didn't want to have to get involved. <laughs> so, like, really nobody cares about him. The only person that ever cared about him at work in his personal life was Zito. And he's gone. And so now you can see why he mm-hmm. has dug himself in this hole that's so deep. He can't get out. And nobody cares. And I think something that I didn't think about until after looking back at the season was that it, when we see him in, in free fall, something is noticeably missing in Stan's home, and that is Holly. I think that that's not only do we see how kind of isolated and lonely he is in that episode and how he's falling into this gambling and stuff. But we kind of see him bottoming out at the very last episode and the one person who he had at home who was supportive of him isn't there anymore. And you can see how with his gambling that it's basically cost him everything. It's going to cost him his job. Yep. It's going to cost him all of his work friends. It's going to cost him, it almost cost him his other, like his only friend outside of work Mm -hmm. they had to go kill a guy to to rekindle their relationship (laughs) (laughs) you see how much he's drinking he's a regular at the strip clubs and all that stuff like he is tanking his whole life is in shambles it's like literally in shambles and nobody even pays attention to notice the only person that you see in the end like in too much too late is that sunny is the only one that's still checking in on him yes he is but in his sunny way mm-hmm. where he doesn't really 
Like, does he go out? He knows in that episode, he knows that Stan is lying. Does he say, like, I know you're not telling me the truth? No, he's just like, okay. He shakes his head like, mm, I know you're lying. But okay, <laughs> I can't do anything about it. John, what is your number two episode from season five? My number two episode is Much Too Late. It probably would have been number one, but NBC was too chicken to air it. Uh, <laughs> so it never went to air. But we get the fabulous Pam Greer back. And Pam Greer actually isn't even the best. That's when we get CCH Pounders. It, like, so Pam Greer isn't even the best guest star in the episode. Uh, and I love Pam Greer. It is such a strong episode with, with even though it's, controversial especially at the time it is such a well done episode Le legitimately had it run in the season you would have said like that's the best episode in the season but i can't give it number one because nbc was too chicken to air it uh, <laughs> you, you know and i think the fact that dick wolf kind of went back to that plot line multiple times throughout his law and order and other shows like i think that speaks to how strong that episode is you're right john the hard part for me is to not pick that as being number one yeah in fact i i guarantee you that will end up in our show next week for the top five episodes of my advice all time yes, if, if it not will. it's like hovering yes. right around the top five mm -hmm. yeah yeah so i mean if more important to season five as it aired i would have easily given it number one but because nbc pulled it and it really didn't air until years later. You can't really give it number one in season five when at the time no one saw it who originally watched season five. So my number two episode of season five is over the line because it blew my freaking mind when we got to the end because I didn't put together throughout the entire episode. I'm the only one in the whole world that didn't put together that Highsmith was the dirty cop that was leading yeah, was this like, whole organization. Like, okay. You're like, what the? It was a jump up out of my seat moment when I realized I'm yes. the chief of police. And I was so, so excited for Freefall when I saw that Highsmith was going to be in it, that it was the same writers and directors as Over the Line. Yes, I loved the Highsmith, the dirty yep. chief of police that has his own vigilante police force because he doesn't believe in the judicial system that the police can be judge, jury, and executioner. I was so ready for it when it came to Freefall. I know you, because you were like, oh, does that mean that he's going to be a big part of the story in Freefall? I'm like, yeah, he's a big part, all right. He does get shot and killed. Does that count? He's well, there. And, and to be fair, like, he might not have been shot and killed had he stood a little bit further back and maybe, you know, closer to something he could hide behind <laughs> yeah i mean i know we made a lot of fun of that episode because of like all the cloak and mirrors and like <laughs> why would you get in the limo with these like 49 people that surrounded you with guns and told you to get in there i don't know but okay but it was it was a good episode and it was it was exciting it was like an exciting episode right like the things that were going on they're also forced to be undercover so yeah. they had to deal with like seeing other police officers get shot like all this stuff that came along with yeah. it to pretend that they were actually mm -hmm. like actually maybe listening to what that team's offer was. Yeah, they had to talk that guy basically into dying, right? Like the young cop that they killed. Like they talked him into staying and then he ended up being murdered after. So maybe it's Sonny's fault. I'm just saying. No, I'm <laughs> well, they also sat by and watched those poor cops going door to door get yeah, wasted. I know. <laughs> just had just trying to do some campaigning. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get some money for the policeman's ball and they just get <laughs> shot up and you know they just watch the whole thing go down all right melissa i'm gonna come back to your number one favorite episode because you and john have the same one but we're gonna do it in order and you're gonna see how it's gonna be in order right now because my number one episode is hostile takeover which is the first episode from season five and you get to really really see how evil burnett can be because he sabotages an entire family. Not 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 he takes over drug the drugs in South Florida. He personally handles an entire family in that episode. <laughs> he takes care of the whole family and some truckers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and honestly, it was a tough choice for me because I felt like it could go either way. Like I could have gone with this one or the one that me and Melissa both picked. So like like, I felt like I was justified in either one I picked, but there was one thing that made me go with the other one. Absolutely. And that's what we're going to give it away because obviously it goes in order. And the next episode is... 
Redemption in Blood. Of course. I mean, you've got to love badass Burnett. I even said at the time, I would watch a whole five season show just about him. Just about <laughs> the badass Burnett crime family. Gato was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> he added plenty of plenty of of uh, of comedy to the episode. But the one thing that pushed me over the edge, just it had to be Morris the Panther, man. You gotta <laughs> love the Panther. <laughs> Well, I picked it because it has my like one of my all time favorite scenes from Miami Vice, and that is when Crockett starts to remember who he really is, and he walks into the police station, mm-hmm. and he's like all smiling because he's mm-hmm. like, "Oh my god, this is this is what it, this is where I'm supposed to be. Like, this is who I am. Like, this is what it is." And everyone's pointing a gun at him. Even the old lady who does like the filing has a gun, <laughs> and they're pointing at him. Like, that's my favorite. Like, one of my, the, I think one of the most iconic scenes for me because you see, like, he's he he's like the realization, like, "Oh my god, this is it. Like, there's my locker." There's my death, and everyone is turned on him because they and that's don't what trust I'm, him. And I totally agree with you. And it's the same thing with Hostile Takeover, and why I picked that. Because when you end season four and you see him drive away in that boat, and Tubbs is yeah. like yelling to him, you don't see him again, right? Until that scene where they're at the party. Yes. And they come up behind him, and you, you see the ponytail, and he turns around, and you see that it's Sunny, and he's with the bad guys. Yep. Like, that's one of those moments. Yeah, you're like, Ugh. it's an iconic moment, right? You're like, oh my God, I'm uh-huh. going to remember this. Like, I'll remember this scene. And like, I always, when I go back to the last season remember that scene where he like remembers who he is and he's like okay and then there's all those flashbacks of him and tub like wrestling and <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> running together I, just, I don't know he turned into rocky all of a sudden i don't know what's going on <laughs> I, I love how in hostile takeover how ruthless he is and how ruthlessly he takes over the crime family the good of a crime boss he is i mean totally tony montana has a hot chick and and a, a panther. He just makes such a good crime boss that I'm surprised I haven't seen him in more crime boss roles after Vice. There is absolutely no coincidence that we all picked for our top episode from season five that it's an amnesia story. Yeah, I mean, it could not be any other episode. Mm-hmm. So that's our favorite episodes from season five. We mentioned before that when the show was good, it was running on all cylinders. And the episodes that were good were amazing. And then there was bad timing. So there's... <laughs> and there's, then that's there was how bad. The went. So... <laughs> yeah, that was the thing that happened that we want to forget. But... <laughs> but when things were good, they were really good. So before we give our final thoughts on this season, though, let's go check in with season five music and some of John's favorite moments and our favorite moments from season five when it came to music. Because although the budget was a little tighter, there was some really great moments in music. So let's go take a look at that. All right, John. Music was up and down. Not going to hide it. It totally was up and down. But because of that, we also got some new people that would, in the previous seasons, would never even be given a chance at being in the music in Miami Vice. So I'm really looking forward to what you picked out for the highlight for music in season five. I think, you know, we had a lot of fun in music. We got to learn about Chicago Transit Authority and why the actual Chicago Transit Authority doesn't want them to be uh, associated with them. You are not Um, welcome on the D train anymore. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You got to take a cab, Peter (laughs) Cetera. We got to do some deep dives on some pretty big bands. We got to do a deep dive on The Cure. We got to do a deep dive on Public Enemy. Not only did we get some really big names, but diverse names. We learned that the Glenn Miller Orchestra was not only bigger than Jesus, but at one time bigger than the Beatles with 16 (laughs) number ones and 69 top 10 hits. And I mean, they did that in three years. We, We got some interesting things to talk about. Ultimately... I've narrowed it down to three songs and three artists that I think kind of fit season five. Number three being Keys to the to Imagination by Yanni. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. That is right. We actually had to do a deep dive about Yanni. And never <laughs> at any point during this podcast did I think that there was ever any reason for me to bring up or discuss Yanni for anything. <laughs> and it's favorite moments in my life ever if you were forced talk about not yawning. to learn about yanni I can't unlearn this type of stuff like now <laughs> i know stuff about yanni in the future if i'm playing a board game and i get a question right about yanni i'm gonna have to admit to people that i know stuff about yanni 
And I think that speaks to the obscure nature of some of the stuff we get in the music for Vice. Sometimes it's really obscure. Number two represents the big, big artist or the big song during that time or the year. We have Paradise City by Guns N' Roses. And that was in the episode Leap of Faith. That was like... City was huge. Guns N' Roses were huge. And this goes back to when we started the show and we talked about MTV cops and how they used the, some of the biggest music. And we didn't get a lot of big, big like music as far as popular at the time playing over and over on MTV. And Guns N' Roses was one of those. Paradise City, like that was their first big hit. That was the first hit that was starting major rotation on MTV. And it kind of fits that as far as the music goes. It's like we still got a couple really, really big names in our music in season five, even though they scaled back the budget. Which do you think got more play? Guns N' Roses on MTV or Yanni on PBS? <laughs> <laughs> I think the bigger question is, when do you think Axl Rose is going to finish his next album? Like, 10 years? <laughs> 20 years? Like, how long? He's doing it a letter at a time right now. So last, I think, as in the beginning, we find ourselves at the very last episode of Vice, once again, surrounded by the members of Genesis. <laughs> so Genesis' Land of Confusion from Freefall has to be the number one song that kind of defines season five. Be because if you've listened to any of my mi music segments, you will know Phil Collins, Peter Gabriel, Mike Rutherford, and every other member of Genesis has popped up in, a, I would say, at least 60% of my music segments in some form or fashion. In some ways, Phil so. Collins has appeared more than some of the Vice Wiggler characters. <laughs> and the only thing, the entirety of music that we didn't do was actually talk about Genesis themselves. We talked about them individually in a billion different ways and in a billion different people's breakdowns, but we really didn't talk about them as a band. And so... Very fitting that the final episode of Vice, we get them as a band with one of their biggest songs, Land of Confusion, which, by the way, since we did that episode, I have been hearing Land of Confusion in one form or fashion everywhere I go. <laughs> Either on the radio, I've heard the cover version. I believe Disturbed has a covered version of that song. They do, which I just found out in the last week, too. <laughs> It has been literally stuck in my head for like the entire week. If doing these music segments for Vice has done anything, it is permanently imprinted Phil Collins and Genesis in my head. <laughs> As I said, it is fitting that they're the last thing that I talk about in any of my music segments. You are right. The times that they've all appeared and that how important it is that they ended with Genesis, they really did hit it out of the park because we have this that Genesis is in the final episode that we get that like the backbone of the music for almost all Miami Vice episodes. And then also that in this week in Vice, Phil Collins is the last number one song in, in the eighties. Like things just buttoned up so well. It almost feels like it's staged. Exactly. Exactly. We started with Phil Collins. We're ending with Phil Collins. Goodbye eighties. <laughs> Well, John, season five music, although we, I think we went into it with low expectations, it really did deliver because of the people that they had. And yeah, there was an episode of dumb music and there was those kinds of things that happened. But when it delivered, it was the same thing with the episodes. Like when it delivered, it was really good. And yeah, there was times it was bad, but when it was good, it was really good. So now let's go over and give our final thoughts on season five. And let's wrap this one up and put season five to bed. That way, next week we can go talk about our what we think about Miami Vice as a whole. So let's give let's go give our final thoughts. Okay, Melissa, I'm going to give you the first word here in the review of season five. You're our vice expert. Where do you stand on season five now that you've had rewatched this so many times, but now that you've rewatched it with people who have never seen it before? It's so hard to describe season five because it has literally some of my favorite moments, like my not my favorite moments, but like the best moments of Miami Vice with the Burnett arc and some of the worst moments. <laughs> For example, the episode where his cousin comes to visit. I hate that episode. That's a terrible episode. <laughs> <laughs> Bad timing. Also another terrible, terrible episode. So it, it's very conflicted. I 
uh, obviously as a whole, I love Miami Vice and it's needed. And so it has some of my favorite moments, but it, you can't escape that it also has a lack of everybody else in the show. And from what I read, everyone was disappointed in the last season because it lacked the duo so much. And they were mad because they were putting Stan and like tubs together to work together and stuff like that. So I feel like the Miami Vice writers did the best they could do with the situation, which was that that Don Johnson and several other people were just done. They just didn't want to do it anymore. And they were done. So they checked out and they were doing other things. They had other, you know, they had careers to think of. So they did the best they could do. But it definitely showed in the writing and it's, the show suffered for it. So, I mean, am I, I was happy with season five. I was happy with the closure. Could it have been better? Yes, it could have been better because it could have included everybody in their storylines instead of being like, well, there's the girls in the back and they're passing through the room, <laughs> you know, like that kind of stuff. Where is dad? Oh, he's doing, he's testifying again. I mean, they, they, I just feel like they could have come up with something better than what they did. Or they could have like arranged it better. Like maybe like it was better when they had where Crockett would be just in the beginning of the episode. And you're like, oh, okay, he's got to go do this thing. You know, like that was more believable than that dad wouldn't be in the whole episode at all mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John, what are your final thoughts? I felt like it was kind of three mini seasons. Obviously, we talked about Redemption and Blood and uh, Hostile Takeover as our favorite episodes of the season. But they were so early in the season. And like I said they could have almost been the end of season four and not been included. I feel like because we watched it with the lost episodes in place of where they should have been, Rather than how it was aired on NBC, I think some of those lost episodes kind of saved the season for us. With how good Too Much, Too Late, and Miracle Man were, they really added some really good episodes at the end of the season. Had we watched those after Free Fall, not in order, I think I would have had a different feeling because it would have felt like season five would have been a little bit worse and a little bit, I would have been a little lower on them. But I felt like by watching the lost episodes, and I expected the lost episodes to be the worst episodes of the season. That's why they showed on USA. And except for the Dustin Lazard uh, episode, they were some of the better episodes. I think as the season went on, I could start to feel it fizzle out. And I got a little bit of hope in the lost episodes, particularly, like I said, with like too much, too late. And then Free Fall, I think, was kind of the epitome of, of season five like it wasn't really good but it wasn't really bad it just kind of fit at least that's how i kind of uh, kind of see it like it, it, season five won't be my favorite season vice but it won't be my least favorite either yeah i don't have anything to disagree with you guys on here i'm really torn on which direction i would want to go with season five it's either a it had a lot of unnecessary episodes and it should have been a shorter episode bad timing victims of circumstance the cell within i'm looking at you three you three were a problem <laughs> <laughs> i don't like you <laughs> but do you take those unnecessary episodes and turn it into a shorter season there is absolutely a path in which the amnesia arc ends and we roll straight into that free fall and in free fall they Sonny redeems himself and also just throws caution to the wind and brings down someone and then quits at the end of that episode. There's absolutely a, a way that, that you end that way. It's like a four or five episode arc that ends it and that's, the, and that's right where you go. Or, and this is where I'm leaning more towards actually, is that there should have been one more season and that in season five, we end with all these things happening and there's all these, there's some stories got summed up, but there was some that were remaining that needed to get taken care of and they come back and do one more season. It's like a Netflix saved season and that's what we mm -hmm. get nowadays. So they come mm -hmm. back, they finish off some more of these storylines, they do some fan service, but I think at the end of season five, they were actually just starting to catch their stride and that they actually did have another season of episodes in them and in other episodes that kind of wrote themselves that would happen in a season six. So I can't mm -hmm. decide too much of season five or not enough season five. I'm really caught in between. I wonder, too, like if they hadn't tried to spin it off at the end, if they would have taken a few more chances, they could have been bold and they could have killed off another character in that final season. And it would have really shook up the season. Like like if maybe after Miami Squeeze, maybe you kill off Castillo, you know, and it shakes yeah. up everything going in the free fall. So in the end, I feel like the season was rushed that we quickly 
sum up story arcs that weren't ready to be summed up. And so everything just comes off as being rushed. There should have been another episode of the Burnett story arc. There should have been another Gina episode. There should have been another Stan episode. There should have been another Castillo episode. So everything just felt like it's rushed. And that's why I lean towards there could have been a season six. And even if DJ left the show, there was enough left over of the other people that they could have done, even if it was on USA, that they could have done a whole season Mm -hmm. of just them and letting Stan and Tubbs work together. Yeah, it's true. I I, I think they could have done that. It's a shame they didn't like look into that. So in the end, this season doesn't change my mind on Miami Vice. And actually, I like this this season. There are some misses, but it's what we know and love about Miami Vice. They're willing to take some chances. It's okay. They're still the best cop show of the 80s. I still love them because they refuse to take themselves seriously. That they'll do jokey episodes. That they'll have some fun with the storylines. That Izzy will make a move on Valerie Gordon in the middle of an an investigation. Like, I still love that stuff. And the good in the season far outweighed the bad. So that is our final thoughts on the season five. Now, let's go take a look at the clip show of what was season five and some of our favorite moments that happened during this season. Because there is some amazing stuff that we talked about that came up, that we noticed, that happened in music, that happened in guest stars, that happened through our episode breakdowns. And that's what we're going to listen to right now is some of our favorite stuff that happened in season five. Episode 10, To Have It To Hold. Back at Ramones, when they come I in swear. there. And I show up every time you try and do drug stuff. <laughs> Maria sees Cooper and Ramon come in. Ramon leaves angry. Maria invites Mr. Cooper upstairs. Mr. Cooper? Is that what she calls him? <laughs> Mr. Cooper. Yeah. Come, Mr. Things- Cooper. Let me bathe you. Yeah, some weird-ass crap going on. <laughs> Things get pretty personal pretty fast. Tubbs with his shirt off. Maria says she can't stand it if anything happens to him. Then it becomes foot Doing rubbing time. Sweaty, <laughs> sweaty things. <laughs> Tubbs is going to get nice and sweaty and just grease her up real good. <laughs> oh, oh, man. It's about to get moist in here. <laughs> Post-coital like, bedroom. <laughs> Cooper is leaving. She doesn't look very satisfied. <laughs> I, think she, uh, I, I think she regrets things. He says, stay here. Don't leave. You're safe in this room. He, <laughs> he leaves. She immediately leaves. Goes up to Carlos Jr. Up to see Carlos Jr. They embrace. You realize oh, wait, wait, now. Wait, wait. Oh, I wasn't too sure on this because it almost looked like Carlos Jr. was like watching from a closet. Like she didn't seem to go very far to see him. I, 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 I'm just saying, there's a possibility Carlos Jr. just watched that whole interaction get down. Episode seven, Asian cut. Carlos, the, the professor's doing an amazing PowerPoint about what torture is and how it affects people. I swear to God, if this room is full of dolls <laughs> and torture dolls, I'm going to strangle someone. I, I better well, not be. He is doing this great PowerPoint. That's clapping. He's got a full crowd that's watching him do this presentation. He's got the perfect person to demonstrate what these things are while in his amazing kimono. That does not fit him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, aren't kimonos supposed to be kind of baggy? <laughs> it was a little tight. <laughs> well, you can thank Steven Seagal for changing that. <laughs> Kimonos don't have to be bad. True story. (laughs) He says, we'll see what the DA has to say about that. Cheryl then gives in and says, so Sandy's only working with me for a few days. And like, I don't know. She's not really much of a hooker. It's like her heart just doesn't seem like it's in it. So I don't know how much longer I was going to keep her around. And Tub says, well, it's fine because she's She's dead. dead, And then Cheryl goes, Do you think that she does performance reviews with her hookers? (laughs) It just doesn't seem like you're trying lately. Uh, We're going to put you on probation. Hand jobs only uh, for the next week. I want to see some effort. (laughs) Both hands this time. (laughs) Episode 8, Hard Knocks. Secondary characters try and hold their own montage. They can't handle it. So, and then they get sick all over their shoes. <laughs> <laughs> this is confirmation on how of a much of a mess Stan's life is. Gambling, drinking, strip clubs, drinking on the street, 
stumbling around, getting in fights at these places that he goes to. Ruining his relationship. Places. We, <laughs> yeah, destroying relationships with everybody that he knows. He is a mess. I was pretty sure he was going to sleep on that park bench. I thought for sure, too. Like that, that's, that's just where he was going to crash that night. And during all of this, Holly's at home with the most amazing looking corn on the cob waiting <laughs> on the table for him. How many uh-huh. corn on the cobs were they going to eat, though? <laughs> there was like oh, Holly. 17 corn on the cobs in that plate. And just two of them. She made like a whole turkey? Like, what is going on? If I make you a Thanksgiving dinner, your ass better be there. <laughs> She's a damn good girlfriend. And I, I bet you she was a heck of a wife to Lonnie as well. <laughs> so now- Episode 1, Hostile Takeover. Oscar says he needs to get a breath of fresh air. He goes outside, and this is when we see the power ponytail. Oh, it's a good ponytail. There's Sunny. Evil Burnett. Yep. <laughs> Evil Sunny see, is need, out there. He needs an eye patch. That way we can know with the eye patch <laughs> and the ponytail that it's Evil Sunny and not regular Sunny. You know what would have been better, too? A mustache. A mustache for Evil Sunny. Mm, mm-hmm. Yes. And I don't think Don Johnson can grow a mustache. <laughs> I know he had one. We're sorry, Don. We didn't mean that. I'm just kidding. (laughs) You see Celeste come out of the water. Now the whole time he's having like flashbacks, and it's again, it's more flashbacks of him here in tubs. How much in tubs (laughs) proclaiming his love for Sunny? She comes up and kisses Sunny and asks how she did. Now hold on a second. I know where you're going to go with this, but I I have the answer. This. So Melissa's gonna set it straight, but I'm gonna say how I felt when I was watching it. This sounds this sounded an awful lot like there was a threesome happening the <laughs> night before with Miguel, Sonny, and Celeste. She was like, How was I last night? She's like, you ain't got Miguel's heartbeat thumping. And she's like, Yeah, I don't I did like you really like that kind of stuff, don't you? And I'm like, Oh my god, things are real <laughs> freaky at the Carrera. Hey, I got all excited. Hey. In reality, it's just- Episode 21, Free Fall. After that night, Sunny's wig plus tubs are trying to sneak in by climbing over the wall. <laughs> All you can see is when he runs yes. that hair. Like, how's it staying on? Is it really real? Why didn't you wear the ponytail while you were doing the mission? That seems like that's more... I, I have long hair. I know what it's like to run with your hair in your face. You put it in the ponytail. <laughs> uh, well, when they get there, he posts up. And he's like bending down looking at the blueprints. And I'm sorry. These are corny blueprints. I mean, they might as well have just drawn it on a napkin. <laughs> like climb over the wall by the big rock. <laughs> it's like drawn in crayon. There's your rock. Of course, they don't listen. Inside, the captain gets a visit from Bianca who tries to seduce him, but clumsily knocks his gun onto the floor. And instead of lying and saying, I wasn't trying to do that, I think my ass hit it. (laughs) She says, you're evil, and I was trying to kill you. And then he says, okay, well, I'll forgive you for this. Just stay here. Yeah, I won't kill you. Just stay here. I will say that scene took a drastic turn. It started out like like the beginning of a porn and just turned (laughs) into some really kind of awkward, like, oh, I'm sorry, I tried to kill you. (laughs) You can just tell that the captain is making decisions while he has a boner. That's why he's not willing to kill her. <laughs> we'll we'll revisit back. this in a half hour. <laughs> I was going to say, but what kind of woman can't distract him? Like, oops, I dropped the gun. Well, that's when you go for the blowjob. <laughs> <laughs> Episode four, bad timing. At some point where, where Sonny realizes, like, I can go back to being a cop and do my thing because I'm not a murderer. Mm. I can stop myself from murdering somebody. And I did. I didn't kill that person and I had the chance. And so now that's when you're supposed to go like, oh, okay, Sonny's going to go be okay. Eventually he'll go back to being a cop and be normal. I don't think it's that deep at all. I think he got on his hog and went on his trip <laughs> and found that little bar and decided, you know what? Maybe I won't be a cop. Maybe I'll be a bouncer like Roadhouse. <laughs> <laughs> he could, I mean, let's get this straight. He's no Patrick Swayze. Oh, oh, interesting. <laughs> I mean, I love Don Johnson, but you cannot be Patrick Swayze in Roadhouse. I'm sorry. <laughs> Saying he can't get away with being Roadhouse? No, he can't. <laughs> I think she's like the wind, just touched Melissa <laughs> deeper than we thought. <laughs> hey, don't trifle with my love for Patrick Swayze, okay? <laughs> At the house, Sonny is trying to convince Scotty, man, you should just cut me down. They're never coming back for you. They're just going to keep the money. You got bad friends. You should make good friends. You should leave your bad friends behind. And that they will get caught eventually. 
And if Scotty is willing to help Sonny, he'll make sure the judge goes easy on him. Oh, oh yeah. He can show him. If he just pretends like he has amnesia, don't <laughs> let him get away with whatever <laughs> happened. He, you can trust him, too, because he's doing it right now, and it's working. <laughs> Scotty starts to cry. I'm, I miss Miriam. Told you. And he goes, and he cuts Sonny down. And Sonny, the first thing he does is punch him square in the face <laughs> as know. hard as he can. Why did he do that? Why couldn't you like, tie him up or something? Like, why do you have to punch him out? Like, <laughs> <laughs> right in the kisser. Yeah. His nose is really broken now, by the way. You know, it, you would think that his partners would have been smart enough to teach him about stranger danger, but no, <laughs> Scott. Down the Episode 18, Miracle Man. The Tevi duo show up over at Torres' house and he's dead. Agia has struck again. He's dead. <laughs> the way you said that. And he's dead, by the way. So now they're racking their brain trying to figure out, okay, how do we get closer to a Agia? He was our only path into getting to Parena. And then you hear that music, like, oh, Miracle Man, you're the only one to save this neighborhood. And you see him come around and he's talking to a crowd saying that both Torres and Agia were bad men. And then he sees the tubby duo and says, they're drug dealers, too. I seen him, which mm -hmm. he has. He saw them yeah. making a drug buy, but then he just ran off. <laughs> but he didn't see. Well, well not Zwitek, Zwitek, though. He saw no. Tubbs and Crockett. We saw Tubby. So, <laughs> so then the crowd starts to turn on them. The Tubby duo go into a house. They ask a police officer to drag the Miracle Man over. That way they can talk to him while he's chanting to the crowd about getting the deadly poisons off their streets and bring them street justice. When he gets inside the house, they flash their badges and tell him. What are you doing? You're messing up everything that we're trying to do, and you're exposing us to these crowds. He says, I'm sorry. I didn't. I thought you were drug dealers. Uh, how can I help you? How can the Miracle Man be a part of this? Dude, he almost kind of pitches it like he's recruiting a sidekick. Like, maybe, <laughs> you know, make Stan, like, sensational son or phenomenal friend. Marvel Miho. <laughs> Episode 5, Baroska. Shows up and says, okay, fine. You can meet with Martillo. You gotta come to my place first. Okay, but can we talk about how they were drinking waters? Like, <laughs> and Judy ordered an orange juice <laughs> <laughs> at the bar. Yeah, yeah and, Tubbs, juice. and once again, Tubbs tries, to, you know, to pull the whole man card and tries to order her. And the lady will have a milk, and she's like, "No, nah, tequila. <laughs> I need tequila to deal with these jackasses." You who? She's gonna have a you who? Ice, please. <laughs> that Later, the police are there. Nice job, Castillo. Okay? Nice job. You, you got, got your, your friend, friend killed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this isn't even the first time it's happened. What about that priest, huh? Oh, don't talk God's about work? him. <laughs> Tubbs tries to console Castillo, and Castillo seems to be handling it pretty well, actually. He's like, I don't need your pity. I'm fine. I gotta go home and work it out later, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Castillo says, no, we gotta find that ship. That's where we gotta do. It's not, I'm sad for my friends. I gotta get revenge. So now Episode 3, Heart of the Night. He says, I'm sorry for thinking about my husband. <laughs> well, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Castillo says he talked to Malcolm and says, why didn't you tell me that Masek was CIA? You lied to me. How dare you lie to me? And she said, like, well, you know I couldn't tell you. That, well, I didn't tell people what you did when we were married. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and then they sleep together. <laughs> and then he asks her if she still loves her husband. And she says, yes. And immediately changes her mind and says, no, actually, I don't. <laughs> and then there's some music. That part's and... not important. <laughs> yeah. There's Let's some start music. talking about it. <laughs> when they fade to music, just want to give a little insight to when we watch this episode. <laughs> it fades to music and Melissa leans over behind me and whispers in my ear, they did it. <laughs> <laughs> because it was like the music and then the sunrise. And you're like, oh, okay, so they did it. <laughs> And then they come back, and she's in her, she's in a robe, and he's like, "You look like you belong here." It was gross. It was creepy, right? It was gross. <laughs> Episode thirteen: The Cell Within. Running up to the door, starts banging on it, trying to get in, triggers the alarm, and so now Jake's got to go upstairs and go talk to Phelps. He brings Barry with him. They lock everyone inside of the execution room. Tubbs says, "Hopefully, my Mister Wizard." Electri electricity knowledge is up to par because he dropped some loose change into one of the switches to sabotage it. Isn't didn't he take night classes for this though? Isn't it what oh, he took? Shit, he did. <laughs> Remember? Oh my god! Yeah, the that night school like is coming two. in handy. Yep. Yeah. No, it wasn't season two, isn't it? Like that's 
got sent, well, that's the send money one. The, oh, yeah, 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 that's right. So season four, the first episode yeah. of season four, he says that he's been taking classes because he's not going to be a cop forever. He wants to get in, maybe do be an electrician. Yes, see? Oh, my God. Those classes paid off. Mr. Oh. Wizard was his teacher. <laughs> that was his professor's uh. name. <laughs> Not that he was lying. He never took classes. Wow. He just watched Mr. Wizard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, good catch. I never thought about his night school experience. Like, that comes <laughs> so handy here. <laughs> Thank God Phelps showed up looking the party. Episode 14, The Lost Madonna. We go to the, they call it a party. I'm assuming it's brunch. <laughs> but like we once we leave that party, we find out the plan is not the simple let's just try and sell them the paintings we already have in our possession. Why not just 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 sell them what they want? So I don't know. L let's go back and talk about brunch. What do you guys think <laughs> about brunch? And Julia is talking to Burnett while they're having this the art <laughs> party at this brunch. And she's asking, how did you become partners? And Burnett's like, he had stolen goods I could sell. We met. I met him in Soho at a uh, gallery in Soho, and he had some goods I could sell. And there you go. <laughs> she introduces Burnett to Sigmar, and Sigmar's like, Sigmar, I don't know you. Sigmar, <laughs> smash! <laughs> Sigmar's like a beefcake. I don't know. Tommy, uh, right? <laughs> Tommy was though. Uh, it was cake. great. Tommy was though. Uh, what's great is that um, Sully tries to fake like they know each other, and he says like, "Oh yeah, I'm so you know, so we met so and so's house, Sigmar or whatever." Weren't you with those three Chinese girls? And then he kind of gives them a, a weird look, and it's like, like, <laughs> what did Bernadette what just was that guy to? doing with those Chinese girls? Wait a minute. Yeah, then he Our goes, goes well, yeah, yeah, that was yeah. me. I was that pervert. Yeah, and then Sigmar is like, you are a very bad boy. Okay. <laughs> what did you just agree to, Sonny? <laughs> Episode 16, Victims of Circumstance. However, before we move on from the scene, this is the first time we see the very crudely filmed of a car <laughs> driving by. That's clearly someone with a camera walking and a superimposed image of the inside of a car door how did this ever make it to air it was the 80s <laughs> how did quantum leap make it to air <laughs> <laughs> it, but it did okay i mean things happened in the 80s not everyone's proud of it <laughs> it just happened the quality of the show normally is spectacular but this Hey, to give him credit, Scott Bakula is still on TV butchering a New Orleans accent. Yeah, so. I know. <laughs> I, I just keep hoping that he finally wins like a daytime Emmy and they finally and he can finally jump. <laughs> he can finally leap. <laughs> Episode 15, Over the Line. On to tell them about we're not criminals. We are tired of criminals getting back on the street. Here's a short slideshow of all the people that have yes. gotten off because the criminal Sorry. justice system is so bad. This is the most yes. dramatic sales pitch that's ever been done. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it's, some kind of, yeah. so it's some kind of cop secret society. And so, like, I'm already on the fence about whether or not T Tubbs and Crockett are about to get paddled. <laughs> And then they move on to the slideshow, which was very well presented. I, I they must practice this a lot. But <laughs> dude, do you hear the criminal the stuff these criminals that they're talking about? Every guy is getting worse. This is Bob Smith. He raped twenty one babies <laughs> and murdered seventy people, and he's off on a technicality. Like Jesus. <laughs> He kicked like, 52 all kids. I learned from the slideshow is that Miami cops are terrible at their job. <laughs> yeah, I thought that too. I'm like, this is not a glory review for you guys. Clearly, you failed at arresting these people. <laughs> and then at the end of the slideshow, like his sales pitch is, we've gotten pretty lucky and people like us. <laughs> okay, but what happens if you say no? Like you just let you go. You're like, no, I don't want to know anymore. Remember, because they're like, if you want to know more, come do this and whatever, and then we'll reveal our, our secret identities. But okay, so, but what if I don't want to know more? Then how do I forget what I've seen? <laughs> 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 it was really weird. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to go home and talk about that together. You and Tubbs be like, I don't know. What was with that guy in the shadows? <laughs> Episode 17, World of Trouble. Upstairs, Sal is coming into his dark apartment, turns on the lights, and there's Al waiting for him. 
And they just hit it off like they never missed the beat. Sal says, I thought you were dead. I thought I'd never see you again. And they're like, hey, I'm here. Okay, cool. What's with dinner? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I love his dad attitude too, because his son's like, how are you here? Won't LaBreezy, you know, kill you? And his dad says, ah, oh, LaBreezy's a pussy. Like 10 years ago, <laughs> I would have I would have taken him out, but I'm retired now. Yeah, I'm not worried about any of that stuff. What are you up to? Oh, oh, you deal on finance and real estate. Oh, I'm just so proud of my boy. How can I be more Italian? No, hold on. I'll hold my fingers up. <laughs> I'm so proud of my son. <laughs> he would be more Italian if he had Excuse me. Of spaghetti. <laughs> while he's yeah, dead. exactly. I was going to say, excuse me while I go make, a, uh, go make a plate of spaghetti now. Exactly. <laughs> That's going to be a great quote on a card. Speaking of food, as this is happening, Stan's delivering sandwiches, a good delivery boy. (laughs) Al wants to know when he can see his grandson. Sal says, I don't know, Rita doesn't like you, so probably not. Yeah, Um, I mean, it's not like Rita doesn't have a reason. (laughs) We thought you were dead. (laughs) Stan delivers that food, Sonny says, I prefer you on skates. And then Stan says, well, fuck you, I don't like your hair. Yeah, I love that. He's like, I never liked your hair, (laughs) dude. was like i don't think that was part of i think that he just came up with that line on his own that was not part written in the script he's like i'm not going to be working with you for much longer i don't like your hair al calls his lawyer and says make sure you've given rita money to, but she won't take it if it's from me and the lawyer says okay fine i can filter it pretend he had an insurance policy it's like Lionheart, the movie. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Everything always goes back to JCBD somehow. <laughs> so let's jump to Tweedledee, Tweedledum, screwing up another hit on Lombard real quick. The two morons are heading in with guns drawn to kill Lombard. You see him, he's just sitting on the couch watching TV. And then when they get there, he's hiding away around the corner. And he pops out and doesn't even you think like he's just going to pop out and surprise them stuff pops out lets them know exactly where he is and then gets in a gun battle with them but still kills both of them afterwards one of the dying hitmen gets it out of them that it, it's uh, breezy so then we jump to the next scene and this is what i want to focus on here the moron screwing up the hit that's not surprising did he rent a helicopter <laughs> to drop the dead hitmen in the labreezy's pool because that that's that's epic gangster right there <laughs> Like, loaded up the dead hitman in his car, <laughs> drove down to the airport. Put him in the and I'm assuming helicopter. paid a pilot to take him, or did he rent it? I thought that, I'm like, is he flying the helicopter himself? Because, like, who's going to be like, yeah, sure, I'll drop that dead body for you. And what's the conversation like when he's loading the dead body? Hey, sir, I, I, I thought this was just for, like, a tour. <laughs> <laughs> Like, no, we're dead. this guy really wants to go swimming. Fly over this specific house. No, hover over this guy's house for a few minutes. <laughs> Episode 20, Too Much Too Late. Meanwhile, at the hotel, Tubbs is trying to talk to Valerie. She says she needs more time. I'm busy with this, you know, with my we'll goddaughter <laughs> and stuff. And Tubbs says, I know this is the wrong time, but we're not young anymore. I love you very much. Will you marry me? And Valerie surprise says i need to be here for lynette doesn't give an answer tubbs then says did you hear me and valerie says yeah i did and then the saddest puppy dog in all of tv (laughs) gets up and slowly walks away so someone get him someone (laughs) give tubbs a, a hug a high five, like rub his head or something. I don't know. He is so sad. It's the saddest I've ever seen anyone. <laughs> okay, he's sad. I get it. But that was not, that was the worst timing ever. Yeah. I have my goddaughter. Yeah, She's just... been raped. Will you marry me? <laughs> yeah. Episode 11, Miami Squeeze. Edwina looks at Woods because he can, she can hear the whistle of the microphone. Ross pulls back her lapel and sees the wire, pulls out his gun, grabs her, and he's going to shoot her. But just then, Tubbs and uh, Stan yeah. come busting in. They shoot Ross's assistant and then dog down. <laughs> Edwina! Dude! Oh, dude, this is ter- not only do they just come in and start firing at them while he, while Ross has 
Woods as a hostage. So with complete disregard to the hostage, to the congresswoman's life, they just start firing and they hit the the innocent dog who was just <laughs> an innocent bystander in all of this. Like, I, uh, just to, and it's, and you know it's Tubbs too, because Whitech gets the assistant guy. But Tubbs, I, I don't think Tubbs likes dogs. <laughs> Let's preface this with any background noise you've ever heard in this podcast has been John's dogs. So John, as I was watching this episode, when I saw that Avina had got hit, I imagine that when John saw it, you know, 2,500 miles away in Seattle, he got out his Glock 9, put on his John Wick <laughs> suit and was going to go get some revenge. <laughs> but he was buried under Damn two dogs, right. so he couldn't get up. <laughs> Damn right. Vice having to go shoot the dog right before the end of the episode. <laughs> dog was the only character I liked. <laughs> episode 19, Leap of Faith. Of course, the next day, the YCU show up at the waterfront to find Ray and Claire dead. In a car accident. In the yeah. water. <laughs> <laughs> I would drive their car right through that water. Why did they stick Ray's hands in his pants before putting them on the gurney? <laughs> I thought that was weird, too. I was like, way to be rude to the dead. That's the way they all know him. He's just constantly <laughs> masturbating. <laughs> I guess they didn't want his arms to flop around. <laughs> they carried him. <laughs> Specifically in his will. There's a DNR. <laughs> it stuffed my hands in my pants. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was weird, too. It's just so weird. Because they, like, zoom in. And mortician guy or whatever who's loaded him in the gurney. He up his pants and stuffs his hand in there. <laughs> it's just so weird. That's just his thing. That's what he does to all the dead people. <laughs> <laughs> That's just Bill. Episode 2, Redemption in Blood. A, a blowed up dry cow? <laughs> like. Well, Melissa, hey, you brought this up while we were watching it. There's only one way to cure amnesia. You have to get it. However you got it, you have to do that self that to yourself again, right? Yes. So and all the on all my expert TV watching, when Stephanie got <laughs> amnesia in full house, it was because she got hit in the head with something. So they dropped something else on her head again and then she remembered all of a sudden. <laughs> so that's what happened. He got he got it from an explosion. What's gonna happen when he has an explosion? He's gonna wake up and be like, I am Sonny Crockett. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Now, using that same group, does that mean if we blow him up again, we'll get Eve Burnett back? Yep. There's always a chance. It's lurking in there. This is scientific, people. I've done the research, okay? <laughs> Years of TV watching has told me that I'm going to get amnesia one day. It's because I got hit in the head. <laughs> and you have to hit me in the head again. So I got to do the exact same thing. However, you got yes. to fall on the stairs. If a yep. grandfather talk fell on yes, you. Like, exactly. whatever it is. Like, yep. got to do that exact same thing. Not, got yep. it. Got it. Yep. Okay. So now we know. <laughs> <laughs> well, so all of our guest stars, except one, is from the previous episode. Already met. Celeste and Cliff and everyone. We talked about them last episode. So I guess the only guest star we're left talking about is Morris the Panther. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite, actually. The best one yes, of this episode. Yes, and Morris the Panther, he, he didn't do much film work after this. Uh, he could be viewed at the Miami Dade Zoo for a short period in the 80s. And we assume that he is dead uh, because I don't know how long Jaguars live. <laughs> so Morris, if still alive, uh Hit give us up. a shout. We love an interview. <laughs> I'm lying. That couldn't find any info on Morris. They could have <laughs> <laughs> I made it up. <laughs> Makes like a whole backstory for him. He got into acting when he was a, a young cub. Episode six, line of fire. He starts to walk out the door and he comes back and that was that was messed up, man. Yeah. He starts crying like a baby. <laughs> He's like, that was mean, basically. Like, that was so mean. And here's something. We know, like we've talked about the meat bondler and all these other things in the past of the show. And there's this theme of how we like to pick on certain people. Melissa <laughs> has no heart for little bitches. No, I don't. <laughs> Got popped in the nose. Too bad. Suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> he was there when that, that, because what they were saying was he was there when that Dexter Sims guy got killed. 
and he got burned up. Like they lit him on fire. So it's like a big deal. And he's like, well, you he, he want him to do what he did to Dexter? And he's like, no. <laughs> I could tie it all together for you people. Melissa is Mexican. And although, <laughs> although she is in support of our vice team, she doesn't have any time for snitches. No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> snitches get stitches. <laughs> It's just going to go sulk in his room the entire time then. Hey, guys, what does the Vice Squad have against Frosted Flakes? <laughs> uh, first, was there was that... <laughs> first, there was that was Tony the Tiger... Uh, <laughs> tiger comment earlier. Yeah, first we had that Tony the Tiger comment, which was a little off-color from Crockett earlier. I mean, <laughs> and Tony's not known for doing blow, but okay. <laughs> And then now, now they're eating sugar cats, which is clearly a knockoff of Frosted Flakes. He's eating it with Can soda. Can we give the tiger some love? He poured soda in the yeah. bowl. That's why they're like, that's that's going to rot your brain. At that, that's like addictive. He, yeah, he's got soda in the bowl. Because <laughs> he's so metal. He's so crazy. I'm such a crazy teenager. This is what the crazy young guys do, right? <laughs> Well, I mean, maybe you wouldn't put soda in the bowl if the Vice Squad would splurge for some name brand for Austin Flakes. <laughs> Can we get some Tony the Tiger in the house? Episode 9, Fruit of the Poison Tree. Sonny happens to stumble upon a homeless man's going to hold up a hot dog stand. The most Miami thing ever. A homeless <laughs> man's going to hold up a hot dog stand. There's no that. one's going to steal a hot dog while Crockett's <laughs> on the case. <laughs> Sonny pulls out his gun and stops the robbery, but then someone else sees that Sonny's got a gun and everyone takes off running. I just thought Floridians were used to like guns getting pulled out all over the place. And hot dog stands. <laughs> and hot dog stands being robbed. Yeah. Him trying to break up the hot dog robbery <laughs> threw off the whole bus. Everything goes haywire. Basically, everything goes sideways. Everyone starts running. How important was it for him to stop this guy from stealing, what, 20 bucks from a hot dog cart? <laughs> I don't know. I, you would feel like he would call it into the regular place, but also like good on Sunday night, he stops it right there. But he didn't do it discreetly. He pulled his gun out, held it to the man's back, and was telling him, you're going to stop right now. It wasn't a very discreet operation instead of grabbing him and pulling him away or something like that, and letting the rest of the vice team. I think it's as Sonny insisted on he was going to be there when Roberto went down. Yeah, that's true. He definitely did it in a way that made it look like he was robbing the guy, robbing the hot dog cart. <laughs> yeah, so he was exactly. like second degree hot dog robbery, <laughs> I think is the technical term. Episode 12, Jack of All Trades. Ridiculous name, a, an acapella group, a ridiculous idea, who is actually a famous, probably the only famous acapella group that I can think of. Because I, I don't know, can you name it a famous acapella group? Uh, the pant what's the pantatonics or whatever that's the one that's now the mormon tabernacle <laughs> choir <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're not famous i mean come on they don't have any credits they they've never been featured on west wing <laughs> true five grammys dominant five grammys <laughs> guys want the led zeppelin of acapella groups there you go well, i shouldn't say led zeppelin <laughs> What would be a good group that would represent uh, one that changed members a bunch? I don't know. I'll have to think <laughs> about <know>. it. Uh, <laughs> They're like the Wu-Tang Clan. of. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Swingle Singers is the acapella version of the Wu-Tang Clan. That is what they are. <laughs> that's all I could think about was how there's like 20 million members and they change. And either that or Slipknot, right? And... <laughs> No, no, no. I That is perfect. And now I want to start a GoFundMe to try and get Swingle Singers to start covering Wu-Tang Clan songs. Because I think that would be awesome. This is an acapella version of Cream. All right. <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love for you to come back next week for our final episode of go with the heat ever unless you know miami vice comes back in the fall and then go with the heat we'll, we'll be back, back to cover <laughs> miami vice reboot but for now we're saying this is the last episode ever of the go with the heat podcast we would love for you to come back next week and listen to our breakdown of what our thoughts are as Miami vice as a as a whole we have done it episode one 
to the series finale. We have watched and broke down every single episode that has happened on Miami Vice. So come back, check in with us next week while we give our final thoughts on Miami Vice as a whole and what it means to us as podcasters, as people, and as viewers. What it means to us as we went through Miami Vice for the very first time with our professional Miami Vice <laughs> watcher. <laughs> Melissa. <laughs> so come back next week and see what our final thoughts are on all of my advice and join us for our last episode. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope to see you next week for our series finale and we'll see y'all next time. Bye pals. Bye.